In my experience, there are common mistakes that people make when they make homeless applications or when they approach councils for help when they're homeless. And so I thought I'd do a video just explaining what these mistakes tend to be and what you can do instead. Now, the first thing to say even before we get into it is that Homelessness is a, is, a, is, a, is a legal issue. People don't really realise that. And, and what that means is when you're wandering into a council, when you're making contact with a council, you are entering into a legal process where, in effect, anything you say can be used against you. And ultimately, and I've said it elsewhere, these processes don't tend to be done very fairly or robustly. And so many people get told there's no duty to help when actually there isn't. And an interesting statistic uh, I did with my casework with Just Us in Bedford was that if we divided our, uh, our clients into two columns, so basically one column where people approached on their own in the first instance, and the second column where people approached with our support, with our advocacy or whatever from the start. For those who approached the council on their own, 86% of the time they were told there was no housing or there was nothing that council could do when there actually was. And the reason we know that there was is because we went then back to the council and we got things sorted out and we got them housed. But when we went with people from the start, it's only 12%. So you can see just by having someone who's knowledgeable or, or just taking the time to just to get your head around a few of these key things yourself, you can massively improve your chances. So getting into the mistakes that I see people make, the first one is often when people come to us for support, we'll ask them, have you been to the council? And they'll often say, yeah, 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 I filled in the online application form and I've not heard anything since. And this is a very common issue. Uh, it's not the, not the homeless person's fault. It's the council's fault for not picking up on things. I've said it in other videos, but if, if the council has any reason to believe you might be homeless and you've asked for help, they have an immediate duty to treat you as a homeless person and, and your approach for assistance under what's called part seven of the housing act rather than part six which is what people would be uh, dealt with if they just kind of went through that online process without anyone noticing anything and wh what i mean by this is that if you if you're filling in the online form and at any point you say for example you tick the box which says you're experiencing domestic abuse or you can't afford your um, rent or uh, you can't you know your property is not suitable for your medical conditions or mobility issues the council should, if they're competent, should be immediately recognising that that's potentially uh, a case of homelessness and they should be making inquiries immediately into that situation and potentially, and the key thing is, offering suitable temporary accommodation if there is reason to believe that you might be homeless. So, and again, I've, I've done other videos about the definition of homelessness and a few more bits about this, but that's basically the first thing. So the first problem is that people, understandably, go on the council's website, they follow the housing you know, buttons or whatever and, and, and click through and they end up doing this housing register form and what they don't realise is that actually it's not the fastest way to get housed. I have also done a video about the, the kind of pros and cons of it. But if you are homeless and there is any urgency to your situation, you want to be dealt with under part seven, not part six. So the first thing you need to understand is that it, when, you, when you're approaching a council, don't pick up the phone. Don't wander into the customer service centre because both of those issues, are, uh, both of those uh, methods are not going to result in you getting the help you want to get most of the time. What you need to do is send an email to the, I mean, technically it could go to anyone in the council, but you want to find out what the, the homelessness team's email address is, and you send them an email with some key things. And the first thing you need to say in the very first sentence is, I am homeless, or I'm subject to domestic abuse, or I can't afford my rent, and, and I need your help to, to find me suitable housing. And what you've done there is you've triggered section 184 of the Housing Act, which is a real key thing. Once you get that duty triggered, things tend to go a little bit more smoothly. Not to say it's, it's, without, it's not without its stresses, but that, that's kind of the, the getting your foot in the door of that legal process. And if it's me doing it and if I was homeless, the title of the email would be, this is a homeless application, just to make sure that there's no doubt that that's what you're doing. As I say, two elements to trigger a homeless application, ask for help with housing, give the council reason to believe that you might be homeless. So that's your first sentence. You would then go on probably to say what else is going on. So the key facts, without being you know three sides of you know A4, whatever, it doesn't need to be long. But the key thing, so if it's, if it's the fact that you can't afford your rent, then you need to say that. You probably want to say what your rent is and what your income is and why you can't afford it. If you are experiencing domestic abuse, you essentially just want to say that. And you don't have to say much in that situation. You just say, look, I'm, I'm fearful or whatever and I'd like to speak to someone, I'd like to kind of get some help with this. And again, if a council's doing the job properly, they should jump on that and, and, and be helpful. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff around domestic abuse and homelessness, which is, on paper, it's brilliant. Uh, in practice, it often isn't. But but as I say, that's kind of comes back to that idea of it being a legal process. You want to kind of have a, a grasp of, of the basics before you kind of go into that process, if you've got time to do it. 
So ultimately, the first thing to, to trigger section 184, you then want to basically, and, and that is the you know the two the two things I just said, giving the council reasons to believe you might be homeless and asking for help. You then, if you need a roof over your head, you want to make sure you've triggered what's called section 188 of the Housing Act, which is basically the duty to provide interim accommodation immediately if there's reason to believe that you might be homeless, reason to believe you might be eligible for assistance, which loosely be, uh, means uh, having recourse to public funds. So British nationals, for example, as long as you've lived here, as long as you've lived here for the last six months or whatever, then you would you would qualify and reason to believe that you might be in priority need. So for example, if you are a British national and you're pregnant, you want to say that because that gives the council reason to believe you might be eligible and reason to believe that you might be pregnant. And at this stage, you don't need, you don't, shouldn't have to provide any, any medical evidence or, or kind of supporting evidence. But I would say if you've got it, send it across, you know, attach it with the email just so it's nice and clear. And that again, just gives that count, the council reason to believe these three criteria are met and the, the duty to provide temporary accommodation kicks in, which is why, you know, you can ring up out of hours in the middle of the night and actually do this. But, you know, that's, that's not the ideal. You want to you be doing it in the daytime. And again, if you've got the choice, the earlier in the day, the better. So they've got more time to process it. So that kind of that email is going to trigger these legal duties. What you're often going to get then is is basically a snotty email back saying you need to fill in the online form. And that's not bad advice necessarily, but what you want to do before you do the online form is you want to email them back and say, "Yes, I will. I'll do it as soon as I can, but can you just confirm that you've accepted the homeless application for me or, or some words to that effect, you know? How you know, do you accept that I've triggered section 184 of the Housing Act?" Or do you accept I've, I've triggered a homeless application or whatever? And essentially, you want to get the answer to that email because lots of staff you're dealing with in the council won't actually know housing law at all. They'll have just been told by their boss, you know, some vague stuff about getting rid of people, basically, or whatever, sometimes, not all the time. And so, so really, you're actually dealing with people. Often, you'll know more than they do. And they'll have been told things like everyone needs to fill in the online form when that's specifically unlawful. You know, the, the code of guidance is very clear, which you can, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of just, just kind of go through a few references. So the homelessness code of guidance, if you just Google it and go to 18 point, I want to say 18.5, it basically says that applications, homeless applications can be made to any department of the local authority and expressed in any particular form. So an email to the housing team is a dead cert. You've definitely triggered a homeless application, which is what you want to do. And there's no, you know, there, there can be no uh, requirement that you must fill in a particular form in order to trigger the application. As I say, the form will go through the stuff they need to know. So it's you want to do it, but you want to make sure that email has been accepted as a homeless application before you go any further. So that's that's kind of the, the first mistake I see, see people making is they, they made an online application form and they don't realise it hasn't actually triggered a homeless application yet. They assume it does, understandably, but but it hasn't. And actually what that means is you get people left in limbo. So, so examples, and I've probably used these examples elsewhere, certainly doing the training quite a bit. So working with someone who applies to the housing register, tick the domestic abuse box in terms of, as in they were at risk of domestic abuse, and the council just flatly blanked it for months. Then they finally got around to doing something about it, and they said, you know, until you provide X, Y, and Z information from the police and from, you know, whatever, we won't do anything, which again was unlawful. And then when I got involved, I emailed the council with the in individual's consent, and I said, this is a homeless application. You need to do X, Y, and Z right now. And again, they just refused. So that, that's not that's not uncommon, that you're literally going to be dealt with. The response you'll get is just a flat refusal to accept a legal duty. And there's, if you're a lawyer, you know, or if you get a lawyer, then they can deal with that very quickly. If you're not a lawyer like me, um, as in I'm not a lawyer, you, you really have to go through the complaints process. So in that case, I just mentioned, after the stage two complaint, they did accept the ask, yeah, they haven't followed the law and they need to give staff training and all the rest of it. And potentially it opens up this kind of avenue to compensation. Um, but that's just one example. Another example uh, of when I worked at Just Us, my colleague John was dealing with someone who was undergoing chemotherapy, lived in a first floor flat and the stairs were really steep. And she was so unwell, she couldn't get down the stairs. So the ambulance crew were having to stretch her out of the flat to go for a chemotherapy appointments. She applied to the housing register. She told them this in that form and they didn't pick it up as a homeless application, even though there was clearly reason to believe that she might be homeless because it was not reasonable to continue to occupy that accommodation. So they should have provided temporary accommodation straight away. So again, once we got involved and got it sorted out, got some compensation and, and got a rehouse, crucially. Um, but that's kind of the, situa the kind of situation to see. So don't... Don't be surprised if you get a shitty response, either you know a phone call or a, an email back, just kind of really snotty and kind of you know put out that you've dared to ask, uh, you know, send an email about it. That's unfortunately quite normal. Just just go through it. You know, as I say, that that paragraph I quoted, eighteen point five. Just copy and paste that in and say, you know, this is my understanding. Could you let me know if I'm wrong? 
and they'll just you know they'll, they'll kind of tend to at that point just kind of realize realize that they need to do something and they'll they'll do it right so yeah that's the first thing as i say making sure you've actually triggered a homeless application rather than just a housing register application the second thing and again this is very common for for, for me and my casework and the, um and my colleagues is that we first meet with someone and we say have you been to the council and they say yes you know uh, yeah this, they might have gone to the custom service center or something and we say, okay, what did they say? What did the council say? And they'll say, oh, you know, they told me I wasn't in priority need, so there's no point making an application. Or that they told me that I was intentionally homeless and they couldn't help, or, you know, whatever. About a hundred different things they'll tell you. The next question we would ask is, did they give you that in writing? And, and often the answer is no, they just said it. And what that means is it might as well have not happened. You heard that saying, you know, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. It couldn't apply any more clearly within the homelessness application process. So if you ever speak to anyone on the phone, get their name. If they get like weird about giving you the name, then that's a that's a uh, kind of a red flag that they're a bit of a dodgy one. They should have no problem giving you their full contact details, which includes their name, so that you can kind of correspond with them down the line. So you want to get their full name, first name, and surname, and you have to push them on that sometimes because they'll say, "Oh, you know, I'm Andrew," and it's like, "Andrew, what? I need to know this." But if you ever speak to them, you want to follow up with an email and giving a detailed summary of what you just said, so that you then have a legal record. So, if, for example, you've been told that. Um, you know, you're not in priority need, so there's no point making an application. Then send an email back to them saying, you know, this is what you told me. Is there anything else I can do? When they see that in writing, they'll panic because they'll realise that they've just, uh, you know, they've just broken the law and, and there's now a written record about it. So what they'll often say is, no, 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 I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You know, come back in and we'll, we'll kind of sort it out. So, so again, having it in writing, having that written record is going to be the thing which is your defence against getting fobbed off or whatever. So yeah, and ultimately through the whole application process there's a number of different decisions the council have to make some of which have to be in writing and have to be able to be challenged in uh, through the review process so for example the, the section 184 notification which decides you know what what duties owe to you that has to be in writing and it has to explain how you challenge it if you don't think it's right um, but there are other decisions that the council effect, in effect makes. So, for example, when they're deciding whether there is reason to believe that you might be homeless, might be eligible, might be in priority need, that does not have to be in writing. And the only way you can challenge it if they get it wrong is to go through the courts, which you need a lawyer for generally. Although, uh, if you see some of the videos that I'm doing with Will Flack from from his uh, his law channel, actually lay people can do it. But but that's that's for another video. So yeah, so you want to ultimately always be saying whatever they say. Really, you know, can I have that in writing via email? It doesn't really matter as long as it is in writing. And then you've then got that as a record. And as I say, often just getting them to put it in writing is enough for them to to smarten up and actually do things properly. Um, that's not to say that you're still not going to get some stupid decisions, but certainly you, you've got a better chance of doing it. And, and going back to that kind of statistic I gave earlier about the 86% versus 12%, part of that, because often when we go in with someone, we're not really saying anything, we're just there. And often that might just be us taking notes, which is another good thing you want to do, actually, so I'll throw that in right now. If you're going to go to the council at any point, because um, at some point you will have, probably have a face-to-face -face meeting or a telephone, um, telephone interview uh, following COVID or whatever, but if you're having that face-to-face -face meeting or if you're on the phone, you want to make sure it's really obvious that you're taking notes. You know, even if you're not exactly sure what you're writing down, if you're writing down any terms you don't understand, anything like that, they again will realise that you're a bit more savvy because ultimately, and sadly, the more vulnerable you are, the easier it is to fob you off. So if you can demonstrate that you seem to be a little bit kind of on the ball and you know, you're know you writing stuff down and, and asking questions about this and that, that says to them that actually you're not going to be quite as easy to fall boss it off as someone else and hopefully you'll therefore get a better service. That's the second thing, not getting things in writing and, and kind of taking, taking offers is at their word that what they say verbally is correct when often it isn't, um, you know, certainly most people who are homeless will be in priority need just by, you know, or my, let, me, let me say that again, most people who, who need the help of the council will be in priority need, either automatically through things like pregnancy or having dependent children or vulnerability, things like mental health issues, history and armed forces, history and care, those sort of things. So it's, it's quite difficult really for a housing officer to say outright that you're not in priority need. And again, we've seen you know, easy up, upheld complaints where that's exactly what happened. You know, someone who actually turned out to be uh, vulnerable in priority needs were told, oh, there's no reason to think you even might be in priority needs, so we don't have to give you temporary accommodation. So that, as I say, that's sadly very common. Um, but, but making sure you're doing this all in writing 
uh, is going to is going to safeguard you to some extent, even without having to get a lawyer or kind of getting a knowledgeable advocate to help you out with that. Now, the third thing is when people who approach councils don't realise what their rights are in terms of the complaint process. And often, you know, I, I speak to people and, and really they've, they've kind of been kept in limbo for, for months, if not years. They've they've done what they should do. And the council simply hasn't done anything, kind of forgotten about them, whatever. And people don't realise that, you know, there's a complaints process. And actually, that can be very, very effective. It's, if, if you haven't got a lawyer, the complaints process is the number one way of kind of improving your chances of getting the right help. So you want to make sure, first of all, you want to familiarise yourself with the council's complaint process, which in theory should be easy to find. If you Google the council's name plus complaints process, you'll, you'll generally find it. As I say, sometimes it's tucked away. Sometimes it's confusing because there'll be like an adult services complaint policy and a, and a kind of a school's complaint policy and a corporate complaints policy and like... What the hell is, is all this? Um, again, you don't have to fill in, in a particular form. Just send it via email. And again, just lay out what your situation is. And again, just as a little kind of additional thing in there, copy in your local councillors, copy in your MP. Um, those sort of things will also help with that kind of thing. One of the first bits of, uh, of kind of um, advice I ever got from the LGO, which is like Ofsted or CQC, but for councils. Um, so I rang them up and I didn't realise how the complaint process worked. So to take a complaint to the LGO, you've got to exhaust the council's complaints process. So you've got to have gone through it all and still not be satisfied. But what the guy on the phone said from the LGO said was, look, you know, you need to go for the council's complaint process, but the first stage complaint, don't send it to the customer complaints you know, email address or whatever, send it to the chief exec. That way you're more likely to get a, a kind of a, a fair response. Um, generally, in my experience, that stage one complaints will never be upheld or very, very rarely. When it gets to stage two or stage three, depending what whatever that final stage is, you'll tend to have a much more reasonable person on the end of the on the end of the kind of correspondence. And also at that point, they know that that, that if if you're not not happy at that point, you're going to take it to the LGO. So as I say, I think I think it almost feels like this like unwritten rule that councils have that the first stage complaint just just don't hop, uphold anything and just hope they give up. Second stage or third stage, if there are three stages in that council, because often there's only two, that's kind of when you actually have a more sensible conversation. So. If you're not getting a response, you know, you, and it's urgent, you're homeless. It's you know, it's not. It's an entirely reasonable thing to to make a complaint at that point, and not give them much time, you know, because if you are, if it's urgent, you need that thing, you know, you need you need housing right now, or you need dealing with as soon as possible. So you know, if if a housing officer said, oh, "I'm going to do X, Y, and Z," and then two days later they haven't done it, and you've emailed them and they still haven't done it, they're not got back to you just send a complaint at that point as i say that for me the, the mistake that people make is they just leave it too long to make the complaint and they should just be they should do it much sooner you know as soon as soon as the council's not done something they should have done send the complaint and then because the other thing that does is again going to back to that kind of thing of you know the more vulnerable you are the easier it is to fob you off if you're making a complaint as as, as soon as is you know is, is appropriate Again, they're like, oh, you know, this person's going to be a bit more, a bit more difficult to, you know, to kind of fob off. So, as I say, don't hang about and and get on the council's website to see what's, you know, see what there is in terms of of kind of guidance on how to do it. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing it kind of links into that the, the 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 previous one I said about not getting stuff in writing. So count, housing officers can say some proper random stuff sometimes. Like it almost seems like they're making up as they go along. So, you know, I remember one of the first cases I was involved in, someone fleeing domestic abuse, and the council said, oh, there's nothing we can do. You know, there's a refuge. It was, I don't know, 100 miles away or something. There's a refuge, and that's all we can do. You know, that's the only help we can give you. And and actually, legally speaking, that's utter nonsense. You know, in that situation, they have to do a far more, um, they have to take far more care and far more effort to support that individual and make sure they're safe. But as I say, they kind of say things which just literally, I don't know, I don't, I don't know where they got it from. And this is difficult, particularly if you're in that, you know, kind of urgency of being homeless and the stress of being homeless. As much as you can, you want to, you want to just check out what they're saying. You know, um, they'll often say things like, oh, you know, there's, 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 there's no housing there. We haven't got any council housing. You, you know, you'll have to find your own property and you have to find your own private rented. That's not legally true, you know, that, and, and often actually that isn't, you know, that in, in many cases, Councils do have reasonable access to, to social housing. So it's something which, as I say, you just want to check what people are saying. Things like, um, oh, you know, uh, you've got no local connection, so there's nothing we can do to help out. If you go to the Homelessness Code of Guidance and look in the local uh, connection section, there's a whole chapter about it, you'll very quickly see that that's not true. And equally, you know, things like a housing officer saying, oh, you know, you've only got depression, you can't be in priority need. Well, again, 
that's you know having having depression is not automatically make you in priority need but it certainly can be and case law says that it doesn't even need to be particularly severe depression to make you to make you in priority need so so again you kind of, housing officers have these kind of weird default myths that they perpetuate and again you know, another another example would be oh you know you're intentionally homeless there's nothing we can do you know again it's quite difficult to be intentionally homeless genuinely you know from a legal point of view and and secondly you know even if you are intentionally homeless if you're in priority you need the council still got to house you for two or three months maybe four months depending on, on what's going on for you to give you that chance to find something else and actually there's a whole bunch of other stuff they should be doing when you're under the relief duty that should should be helpful anyway going back to that kind of idea of taking notes anything the council and anything the officer's saying that's kind of you know like a statement of fact just write it down and, and potentially just get them to repeat it so if they're saying oh there's you haven't got a local connection you need to go back to your home area just write that down and say okay you know so okay just repeat that for me and just write that down so they know that um the, that potentially you know you, you've got that evidence to, to hold against them because that's a straightforward again that's a straightforward compensation claim if they were to leave you homeless through that incorrect information another little one that i, I see people um kind of struggle with or, or kind of uh, it's, not, it's not really a mistake but they kind of they fall foul of is um the online system and and, and every council's got a different system like a an, like an online portal or whatever and they'll say to you oh, you know you need to upload these documents to this portal things like id bank statements all the kind of standard stuff potentially medical evidence all that kind of thing and for a lot of people who use these systems you know you click a button and you like uh, has that has that gone through i don't know if that's gone through or not and you don't get any kind of receipt saying yes you've supplied these documents so what you want to do or what i would do again if i was homeless i would upload them to the system but i would also email them as attachments to the housing officer and then say to them i'm not sure if my documents have been uploaded could you just check for me and if they haven't here they are you know just say i'm struggling with the system or you know i'm not sure if the system's working can you upload them for me you've then got again hard evidence you've got you know proof that you have provided those documents it's important because to some extent councils you know it's, it's reasonable for them to, to need to see a lot of this evidence because their job part of their job is to make sure that they're not giving out housing for no good reason that just they've got responsibility to, to you know, kind of have due diligence with your applications but they'll kind of often get stuck on you know little things like you know some obscure bit of information until you provide this you know we're not going to progress your application and it might be that you've already uploaded it or, or shared it with them and that ends up holding you back for months so again there's something you can do to kind of make sure is as i say send them uh, in an email as an attachment as well as uploading to the system and specifically chase the officer and do not quit chasing the officer with you know until they've told you it's okay all the documents i need have been uploaded because then that that application can progress a lot of the time it's just this pile, you know, this in tray, you know, piling. And, and if you haven't provided that stuff, you just stay right at the bottom. Whereas if you've made sure you've got it and you've been proactive, you can potentially cut months off the time you're going to be in, uh, you're going to be homeless for. And I've even seen situations where people's application have been cancelled because they haven't, you know, they, they, they supposedly haven't provided the information when actually you can show that actually they, they very clearly did and actually the council did have that information. So again you're working with a structure of people who do not talk to each other a lot of the time i remember in bedford there was this case where loads of documents were going missing and obviously the council like oh you know you haven't uploaded it you haven't uploaded it and then some officer opened the drawer up and there was like literally a stack of paperwork of, un of unscanned papers um so that's not unusual but the you know if you haven't if if it's not there they will automatically assume that you haven't done it rather than the fact that they may well have lost it so you want to have that kind of paper trail of, of you actually uh, of uploading it um, and then finally, um, not challenging negative decisions. So not challenging those intentional homeless decisions, the not priority need decisions, um, those kind of things. Now, they are quite difficult to challenge potentially because you do need to have a reasonable amount of knowledge of the law to do it. But the problem you've got is when you receive the letter, not the date that's on the letter, but the date you receive the letter and you read it, you've only got 21 days to challenge it before it essentially becomes set in stone. It's not quite that bad, but you'd have to have a very good reason if you were to make a request a re request a review outside of that 21-day period. So ultimately, I would say with, with intentional homelessness, it's a, it's a bit simpler. So if you've been found intentionally homeless, look through the chapters, chapter 10 of the Code of Guidance. And again, there's things in there that you just wouldn't, you know, you would be surprised at. So, so in one sense, actually, you've, you've got to satisfy a number of criteria to actually be intentionally homeless. And so you have people who actually, you know, may well, in one sense, deserve to be homeless. They might have done something really bad that's made them meant that they've, they've lost their last accommodation. But unless that accommodation was reasonable to continue to occupy, 
then they're actually not intentionally home. So, so an extreme example of this would be where, for example, someone had lost their hostel place, their supported accommodation, because they'd been convicted of a criminal offence, which would be a deliberate act which could be used against them. But then when you look at the service charge that they're having to pay at the, the supported accommodation or you know the, the expenses they're having to put towards the rent, actually, technically speaking, they're not, it's not reasonable to continue to occupy, and therefore they cannot be found intentionally homeless. So, as I say, intentional decisions are a bit more straightforward to argue than... Um, then priority need decisions. When it comes to vulnerability, you know it's hard. It's difficult. The 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 um, the, the, the definition is quite complicated. You know, so uh, it's easy for me to say this. At that point of getting a negative decision, you want to be getting some some competent advocate on your side, whether it's a lawyer, whether it's a you know someone who works in shelter or a CAB housing specialist. But just understand that there's a lot of professionals out there who don't know their arse on their elbow. So you're going to literally, you know, you, you've got to kind of trust that you're going to find someone or get lucky finding someone who's actually got the wherewithal to, to challenge it properly. Again, in our experience, it's a bit like um, PIP applications with the DWP. You know, 60% of, of appeals will be you know, will, will be overturned. I don't know what the percentage is with the homelessness um, t- decisions, but we, we've had a lot of luck in getting getting decisions overturned. Often, if it's priority need, it's they haven't actually they haven't even asked for the right medical evidence to even consider. So, actually, in that case, you would be able to just provide you know a proper doctor's letter or you know additional information that would potentially swing it. So, yeah, there's I mean, there's probably more. That's that's kind of my list for now. As I say, hopefully, there's some practical stuff you can actually do to. Um, you know to kind of deal with those kind of issues but as i say lots and lots of people fall foul of that stuff you know and if if nothing else you know again that overarching thing is homeless application process is a legal process even though housing officers are not lawyers and often they don't have any training at all it's a legal process you need to treat it like that you need to be really really diligent you know with kind of record keeping you know we you know as difficult it is to not lose everything you know when you're moving house like five times you want to you want to keep your documents in a safe place because you are going to need it and you want to keep those records. So if you're keeping a record of, an, of a homelessness interview in January, you might not need that till September. And ultimately, you want to draw on that because, again, I'm going to do a video on this, actually, of how you can claim compensation for failures. But often it comes down to how well you're, how good your record keeping is and what you can prove down the line. So all those written notes, all those emails are all brilliant for you. And you just want to make sure you keep them in all, it's safe in one place just so you get them when you need them hopefully that's all helpful um as always if you find this stuff helpful do subscribe to the channel um and just if you've got anyone you know who would who'd appreciate this kind of information then do just share it with them one way or another just send them a link or something like that because i think that's a good way of getting the information where it needs to go and and keep the questions coming in on the comments section i'll try where i can to to answer questions if they apply to lots of different people uh, and also i guess you know f- for me because i'm so institutionalized i forget what i what people don't know so i notice that kind of the jargon busting often is the is the kind of most helpful videos the ones that people engage with the most so if there are particular terms that you don't know what they mean or if they're kind of particular like aspects of the law or kind of legal wording or whatever that you don't understand just stick it in the comments and i'll try and do a video about them just to uh, just to get that stuff out of basically 